Hello, it's a great joy and privilege to be with you today and to be able to speak on this topic of relationships and marriage. I'm just going to begin by opening in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your life-giving word. And Father, we ask now that as we hear it, uh, you would deepen our trust and our obedience and our desire to serve you faithfully. And we ask for this mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, some years back, there was an article in the paper and the heading read, Natalie Wood, the woman Sydney forgot. Uh, she lay dead and forgotten in her Surrey Hills house for eight years. Uh, she wasn't missed by neighbours, by the local council, the electricity company, her bank, Centrelink. One of the neighbours said, it's terribly sad that she was there for so long. I wasn't surprised, though, people live such busy lives. It's an awful thing to think that a lonely old woman can pass from this earth and not be noticed for eight years. Uh, loneliness is not just a problem for the elderly, though. Uh, the Australian Loneliness Report came out in 2018. One in two Australians feel lonely at least one day a week. 27% feel lonely for three or more days a week. And nearly 55% of Australians feel they lack companionship at least some of the time. Uh, the really interesting finding was that they found younger people were actually more lonely than the elderly. And then COVID-19 came along. Uh, we all got told to stay at home. One in four Australians live on their own. Uh, it's just a recipe for loneliness. One of the greatest wellsprings of human happiness is relating to other people face to face. And that has had a significant hit in recent times, hasn't it? So let me ask you a question. When did you last feel lonely? Is loneliness a feature of your life? You can be lonely even if there are other people around. You know, you can have acquaintances, but you just don't feel like they, they really know the real you. And even when you have relationships that are meant to be an antidote to loneliness, you can still be lonely. The so-called close family that's not really close at all. Uh, the couple who are disconnected and just feel like hollow shells. And did you know that loneliness is dangerous? It's as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, uh, bad for your, your mental health as well. Uh, Mother Teresa said, life without other people is the worst disease that any human being can experience. Friends, relationships really matter. So what's the answer? How do we solve this problem of loneliness? And I think, um, I think we Christians sometimes actually get this wrong. Uh, it's often said the answer to loneliness is to get married. And people quote Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him. Uh, now, I want to say to you, a, a good marriage is a great antidote to loneliness. But I don't think that actually is the heart of what that verse is telling us. And I'll come back to that in a little while. But, uh, but just think about this for a moment. If marriage is meant to be the solution to loneliness, what, is, what does that say about single people? Uh, are they destined to be lonely for all of their life? And I want to say no. No. A really big theme in the Bible is, is friendship. And through friendship, through loving relationships, our relational needs can be met. And, uh, and in our Christian communities... Uh, that ought to be a reality, not just for married people, but for everyone, uh, single people as well. Now, we don't actually have time today to explore that theme of friendship. What I want to try and do is, uh, is two things. Uh, first up, I want to talk about the nature of Christian relationships. We're going to think about some of the things that make relationships work well, whether you're single, whether you're married. 
So that's the first thing. Second thing, I want us to think about the nature of Christian marriage itself. But um, uh, before we dive in, I want to acknowledge that, that talking about marriage might, it might actually be a difficult thing for you to hear. I want to be upfront about that. There could be a whole, whole number of reasons for that. Uh, you, might be, you might be single and you desperately long to be married. Uh, you might have been married once, but it's all come crashing down, fallen apart. You might be married at the moment, but uh, your marriage is full of hurt and heartache, and it's really difficult. And I just want to say that all of these sorts of feelings have really been heightened by what we're all going through at the moment. We're all actually experiencing grief at the moment. We've all, we've all lost certain things in our lives. Um, stuff's been taken away from us that's really important to us. And when you're under stress, when you're grieving, uh, the natural way that we respond tends to get ramped up a bit, amplified. Uh, it's almost as if we sort of become one and a half times the person we normally are. And so for me, you know, when I'm under stress, I tend to withdraw a bit. I've, I've felt even more like crawling into my little shell. And so I want to acknowledge that at this particular point in time, you might be acutely aware of the relational challenges that you're experiencing, whether that's singleness, difficult relationships, whatever it is. And uh, if that's you, I'm really sorry that that's your experience. Uh, it's not my desire. I don't want to rub salt into wounds or anything like that. And I hope that our kind and loving God might have something helpful to say to you today. Okay, so first, first thing we're going to look at, Christian relationships. And the way we ought to relate as Christians is really just determined by how God relates to us. And you see that in our passage from Colossians chapter 3. Notice what it says there at the start of verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, and then it goes on to say how we're to relate. I want you to notice those words. Chosen, holy, dearly loved. If you're a Christian believer, that's saying God has done a remarkable work in your life. Chosen. He's picked you out for a special purpose. Holy. Despite all your imperfections, despite all the muck and the dirt in your life, the things that you don't want anybody else to know about, in Christ, he's washed you clean and you stand before God, holy and pure. Dearly loved, no matter what anybody else thinks of you, how they treat you, God loves you. Loves you with a depth and a passion. So much that he, he was willing to give up his own son to die for you. And there's a word, of course, that describes God's attitude towards you. That word grace, it's a beautiful word. God's free, undeserved, lavish favour, which he uh, bestows upon us. And if you're a Christian believer, God in his grace, he's actually changed you. And the way that you live out your Christian life is all based on that change. You are changed, now live out that change. And so look at how Paul goes on. This is how he puts it. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. What's this saying? It's saying, God's been gracious to you. Now you be gracious 
in the way that you relate to others. So, someone hurts you, don't pay them back. You forgive, just as God has forgiven you. Um, bear with one another. Don't, don't fly off the handle at every little thing. Don't, don't be a prickly person. You know, let, just let some of that stuff go through to the keeper. He says, let love be your favourite item of clothing. Uh, what is it that other people notice about you? Uh, what's, what's, the, what, what's that aspect of, of your character that people notice? And Paul says, let it be the fact that you're always looking to the needs of others. Now, friends, this is the stuff of godly Christian relating. It all flows from our, our new relationship with Christ, uh, a challenge to relate to others as God relates to us, to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, humble, gentle, compassionate, kind the one who didn't look to his own interests, but to the interests of others. But, but there's a problem. This side of eternity, our, our, our loyalties are sort of divided, aren't they? Uh, we've got a deep commitment to Christ and his ways, but we've also got a deep commitment to ourselves and our own well-being. And this self-centeredness is actually the great killer of relationships, whether you're married or whether you're not married. Now, there's a, um, there's a Christian author, there's a guy called Larry Crabb. He has quite a helpful take on this. He says, the basic flaw in our character is not just our self-centeredness, but what he calls justified self-centeredness. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, it's sort of like this. He says, we're really, we're really good at coming up with good reasons to explain away the reason why we're being selfish. So, for example, uh, you know, I had a really rotten childhood and so others need to make allowances for me some of the time. Or we might say, this COVID thing is really getting to me and that's why I lost my temper. Or perhaps we might think, you know, this person's treated me really badly in the past so I'm not going to keep investing in the relationship, I'm just going to give up on it and look after myself. And friends, we all do this sort of thing. We are more tuned in to our other people, to when other people hurt us, rather than when we are hurt, hurting others. And this problem impacts all of our relationships. But just think about it. Just think about what it would be like if we could relate with compassion and kindness and gentleness and love and these other virtues, just think of the difference it would make in our friendships, in our families, in our church community. And of course, it has a lot to say in the context of marriage, doesn't it? Because marriage is a relationship where there's, there's such closeness, there's such intimacy, we have enormous potential to deal out hurt, to receive hurt. So let's think a little bit more specifically about Christian marriage. Okay, what's the Bible's basic teaching on marriage? And the, uh, the essential information is found right there at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 2. And in this world of paradise, which God says, this is very good, what I've made is very good, uh, something was not good. It was not good that the man should be alone. And the purpose of marriage, the purpose of maleness and femaleness is to solve this problem of aloneness. The man, he had other relationships. He had the animals. That wasn't enough. He had God. But something still wasn't right. And as I said earlier, most people think, the man being alone means that he was lonely and marriage fixes that problem. But I don't think that's the heart of the matter. So what does verse 18 say? It's, it says, it's not good for the man to be alone and that God would make a helper for him. A helper, not a companion, a helper. Why does he need a helper? And the answer, I think, is in verse 15. The Lord God took the man 
put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Um, God had given the man a job to do. And he couldn't do that job properly on his own. He needed someone to, his, to assist him in that work. And that's why he needed a helper. So I think what's been said here is that the purpose of marriage, the reason why God put marriage in place was to en enable us to strengthen us to do his work in the world better. Now, lots of marriages today, they're really just another expression of the individualism and the, the selfish, selfishness of our times, uh, where the couple just live for themselves to have their own needs met. Who cares about anybody else? But friends, I want to say to you that a selfish marriage is a destructive marriage. God did not design it this way. Um, a good marriage strengthens, enriches us so that we might overflow and bring blessing to others. It's got an outward-looking purpose to do God's work, to further the work of his kingdom. We also need to take special note of verse 24 of Genesis 2. It says, That is why man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. What's this saying? I think there's two really key things to note here. Your marriage is your primary commitment and it's a permanent commitment. Let's think about those. Primary commitment. It says there you, you leave your parents, you form a new family. Parents, in-laws, anyone else are not to call the shots in your relationship. Your key responsibility is to your spouse, not to your parents, not even to your children. And I want to say, if you have adult married children, don't interfere in that marriage. If you are a mother, I want to say to you, you are a wife above being a mother. One of the greatest gifts you give to your children is having a strong marriage. It makes them feel safe, secure. And you honour God by maintaining the primacy of this relationship over any other human relationship. So, primary commitment. Second thing, it's a permanent commitment. Uh, the word there, united or cling together, some Bible translations have, it means to get stuck together permanently. And then the next phrase there, they become one flesh. That's not about you're losing your individuality and becoming clones or anything like that. It's about forming a new family. Um, we, we talk about families as being our flesh and blood, don't we? The ancient Hebrews spoke about your family as being bone and flesh. And so to become one flesh is about becoming kin, um, forming a new family relationship. And the thing about family relationships is you're stuck with them. Blood is thicker than water, as the saying goes. And they might bring you great joy, they might bring you pain, but you can't easily get rid of them, as uh, we all know, come Christmas time. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus makes a really big deal of this one flesh concept. Why? Because breaking a marriage relationship is like Brothers ceasing to be brothers or sisters ceasing to be sisters. This is a relationship that can't be dismissed lightly, uh, a relationship that, that ought to be characterised by commitment. Um, commitment is at the very heart of what marriage is. Now, I need to say here that I know sometimes marriages don't work out. Um, there's marriage breakdown in my own family. God, in his grace, he actually acknowledges our weakness, our frailty as human beings. And in fact, there's actually times when it's right to leave a marriage. And there's ongoing adultery and, and abuse. That, that can be the right thing to do. But 
we must not lighten the truth of Scripture that, that entering into a marriage is entering into a covenant, into a, an intense promise of commitment, and breaking, breaking that commitment is always a last resort. Now, one more thing to point out from Genesis 2, uh, verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Let us think about that for a moment. Naked and no shame. This is a beautiful picture of openness, intimacy, connection. It's beautiful. Um, a wonderful togetherness that I think is a picture of God's goal, his design for wanting what he wants our marriages to be. Where can, you can be completely open with this other person and still feel totally safe. Now, there are some unrealistic views on what love in marriage is. You know, the ideas of romantic love where you feel warm and gushy all of the time and if you stop feeling that way, that means you're no longer in love and you should walk away from the relationship. No, that, that, that's just nonsense. It's not like that at all. But love in marriage is not meant to be cold, hard duty. There's meant to be joy and delight just read the book of Song of Songs in the Old Testament. And marriage research actually confirms this point. Strong marriages are characterised by this sort of intimacy and connection and closeness. These couples uh, in marriages that work well, they treat each other like good friends. Um, they relate with warmth. Uh, they, they have conflict, but they handle their conflict in gentle and positive ways. Uh, let me give you one, um, one definition of friendship, which I really love. A friend is someone who's happy to see you and doesn't have any immediate plans for your improvement. Isn't that delightful? Uh, you're loved simply for who you are, warts and all. Do you know the number one indicator of marriage breakdown? Emotional disconnection, when you stop having that warmth, that connection, that, that sense of safety with each other, when you stop being friends. Now, so far I haven't said anything about sex. I'm not going to say a lot, but I want to say sex fits into this context. Um, it's relational. It actually builds and strengthens the connection between a couple. It's not just the icing of the cake. In a relationship, it's very, very important. And you can't actually have good sex outside of relationship. Um, God's designed it this way, the sort of 24-hour foreplay of relationship that feeds the sexual relationship, and then that sexual relationship feeds back into the strength of the relationship. Now, the Bible has a whole lot of other things to say about marriage. Um, in God's good design, Male and female difference are actually really important. That really matters. That's why marriage in the Bible is between a man and a woman. And there's some very specific advice given to husbands and wives. And we don't have time to look at that in detail. There's just one thing I want to say that I want to highlight. I want to say something to husbands. We looked at um, Colossians 3 a moment ago. A few verses on from the passage we looked at, in verse 19, it says this. It says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. When Paul said this 2,000 years ago, it was profoundly countercultural. Um, wives back then were often just treated as the property of their husbands. He could do with her whatever he wanted. And the Apostle Paul turned that on its head. This was a revolutionary way to treat women, to love them. What does that look like? Well, love, love goes out of its way to do good for another. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. What did he do for the church? He died for the church. He laid down his life for the church. 
This is costly, sacrificial love. It's tough love. Husbands, this is what I want to encourage you to do, to put aside your own interest to serve her, to help her grow in godliness, to cherish her, to make her feel precious, to make her feel completely safe. No harshness, no controlling behaviour, just selfless love that always looks to meet her needs. Be that sort of husband. Be that sort of husband. Okay, time to wrap up. Two words for you to finish up. One, vigilance. Two, confidence. Okay, vigilance. We do not drift into godly patterns of relating. It actually takes some work and some effort. And let's keep working at it in our marriages, in all of our relationships. And when it comes to marriages, here's what I want to say to you. I want to say the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is green where you water it. So invest in your marriage. Confidence. Let's never forget we serve a powerful and gracious God. And he's actually more committed to our well-being than we are. And no matter, what your, no matter what your situation, whether you're single, in a failed marriage, a good marriage, a bad marriage, nothing can separate us from his good purposes. And this God, he's with you, he loves you, he cares about you, he'll never leave you or forsake you. And that gives us strength. Gives us strength to keep pushing on, to keep serving him, to keep trusting him, to keep working at those relationships. Let me pray for us. Gracious Father, we do thank you so much for your wonderful gift, not only of your son, but of each other. Father, thank you for the people you put in our lives and the joy that they bring us. And Father, we pray you do that deep work in our hearts as you've been gracious to us, that we might be gracious in the way we relate to others, to our husbands, to our wives, to our family members, to our friends, to our acquaintances. And Father, we pray in so doing, uh, we might reflect your nature and your character to our lost and needy world. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.